Welcome Island Shamans to the Haleakala tutorial. Haleakala is a massive shield volcano that forms more than 75% of the Hawaiian island of Maui in the west. Wait, I mean, Haleakala is a simple two player game where players try to build statues around the Hawaiian volcano. It works similarly to a worker placement game, but it's slightly more abstract in its concepts. To begin the game, we'll first set up the board between two players, like this, and then each player will take all the tokens and markers of one color. Here we have the yellow player and the red player. The lava disc is only used in the advanced play, so we can take these out for now and I'll explain how that works after. Then randomly give the starting player token to any one player. Then each player will place their shaman on the board, on the spaces where the huts and villages are. Then we'll take the four generic lava tokens and place them either off to the side or I like to stack them all on top and place them in the middle. Then we'll take the boat token, yeah boat token it's not a shark I was surprised too, and place it on the space with the dock. See there's a small wooden port here. We'll then need to set up the scoring board. Each player will take their scoring marker and place it on the zero space on the top left corner. And then we'll organize all the palm tree cards by their back, shuffle them, and place them on their respective spaces. And the remaining cards will be placed face up as I'm doing here. Then we'll take all the one palm tree cards and deal them face up randomly into the indentations along the board. The remaining cards get placed back onto the scoring pad face down. And now we're ready to begin. The game is played taking turns going back and forth between the two players until it is time to score points. But when it's your turn, you can do one of three things. First, you can place any of your numbered discs that you currently possess onto a space that is not adjacent to the boat. Like this, for example. When placing these discs, you place them onto the beach space of each section of the board. When you do this, you are allowed to move your shaman up to two spaces. However, they can only go uphill one space a turn. So from the beach, we move onto the grasslands, and I could optionally move to the left or move to the right. The reason why you place these discs is almost like a bid for that space because the goal of the game is to collect these cards to perform their actions and accrue points. And I'll explain how you get these cards. We'll say player 2 wants to do a similar thing, except this time they'll place their 5 token, which means they get to move their shaman up and over one if they'd like. So the second thing you can do on your turn is place one of your number tokens on a space that is adjacent to the boat, like so. When you do this, you don't move your shaman. Instead, you move the boat a number of spaces equal to the number tile you just placed, clockwise. So here, we'd move the boat clockwise one space. If the space that the boat finishes its move in has tokens owned by either player, the players must then claim the cards on that space, starting with the player with the highest sum of their number tokens. So here, the red player has a 5 token, so they can take one of the two cards here first, performing its action, and taking their token back into their pool. And then the second player will do the same, claim a card, and take the token back. If the boat were to land on a space where there are no tokens, nothing happens. If the boat lands in a space where there's only one token, only that player may take a card. And as I mentioned, you must take a card. So even if it's impossible to use the card that you're taking, you must take it. Whenever you claim cards, you resolve their effects and then replace that card with another one from the scoreboard, starting with the one palm tree cards and then progressing to the two and then the three. When placing your number tokens, you cannot place a number so that the sum of both of the player's tokens would be equal. So here, the red player could not place their red token because 3 would be equal to 3. They'd have to place something else. So instead they decided to place their 5 token. 
the yellow pair couldn't then place their two token because then the sums would be the same again. They'd have to place something else, like a four. Those are the only restrictions when it comes to placing your number tokens. Of course, you only have so many, so once you've used up all your tokens, other actions become available to you. You could, if you've placed all of your tokens, instead decide to move the boat once placed clockwise, and then resolve its effects as it would normally, claiming cards and taking back all your tokens. Or you could pick up any of your tokens and return them back to your pool. So what exactly are these cards that you're fighting for? There are a handful of different cards here, so I'll explain each one one by one. First, we have the totem. If and when you claim this card, you will take one of your totems from your supply and place it onto a space, if available, where your shaman is. Like such. If you were to take another totem card after that, you wouldn't be able to place another totem because the spot has been taken. So that's why you want to place number tokens that are not adjacent to the boat so you can move your shaman and then continue placing totems. Each of these circular spots can only hold one totem and shamans cannot be on the same space as each other. They can move through each other, they just simply can't end on the same space. The next thing we have are these crabs. When it comes time for scoring, whoever has the most crabs will earn 3 points. Next we have are these seashells. When you acquire a seashell, you can purchase one of the special scoring cards on the scoreboard, which look like this. These will provide extra bonuses if you have them during scoring. Since there's only one card of each available, once a player claims it, the other player cannot benefit from those cards. So you're going to want to claim them early and make sure you fulfill their requirements for bonus points during scoring. This happens when you acquire the seashell, but you could bank it for a later turn. The next card we have is a lava card. When you're replacing the cards on the field, when you draw the lava card, you will instead discard it and place a lava token at the topmost spot where the card was drawn. Then you would draw a new card to replace that spot. If you happen to draw another lava card, either immediately afterwards or at some point later where there is already a lava token, you will still do the same except this time you'll stack the lava tokens. And then we have this lava shift card. When you take this card, you can take one of the lava tokens that have already been summoned via the lava card, not the ones here in the center. You can take them and move them clockwise or counterclockwise by one. This way you're diverting the lava, hopefully away from yourself and onto your opponent. And lastly, we have these pearl cards and a Nautilus shell. These are simply worth victory points when it comes time to score them. If you happen to have the white and black pearl in your possession, they're worth four points instead of their respective one and two. So when does scoring happen? Scoring happens when you run out of the two palm tree cards. As soon as you place your last card, even if you still have other places that require cards, you will stop and immediately begin scoring. Each player has an opportunity to buy any of the scoring cards that require seashells just before scoring if they have seashells in their possession. Otherwise, we'll just move to the scoring. But first, the volcano erupts. To do that, we'll slide each of the discs down one space where it is in front of, destroying totems that were in their place. As the lava slides down the mountain, it takes the totems with it. The shamans, however, are safe, so you don't have to worry about that. We'll get points based on how many totems we've placed on the island and in which section of the island they are placed in. For example here, every totem that is placed on a grassland is worth one point, every totem placed on the forest is worth two points, and every totem placed on the mountains is worth three points, because it is riskier to put them there. And we can move our trackers to show where we are currently on the scoreboard. Then whoever has the most crabs will get three points. After that, you'll score points based on whether or not you have the white pearl or the black pearl in your possession, or the Nautilus. 
then you score points based on the scorecards which you've bought in your possession. So we can just look at these left to right and explain how they work. This card says you'll get two points for every section of the board which you have more totems than your opponent. So if the red player has two totems on the forest and the yellow player only has one, they would earn two points for that. If they have more than their opponent in the grassland, then earn two additional points, and so on and so forth. The next one that we have here is that if you happen to have one totem in each of the three areas of a single section, you'll get four points for each section where that applies. Here in the middle, it says that you'll earn three additional points for each totem you have on the mountain spaces, which can be incredibly valuable, but also very dangerous to maintain. Also, to acquire this scoring card, you would have to spend two seashells. Fourth from the left here, it says that you'll score one point for every card would you possess that has a butterfly in the top right corner. And lastly, on the far right here, it says you'll score two additional points for every totem you have on a forest space. The players will score their points, and they will keep all the action cards which they claimed. However, if they bought any of these scoring cards, they would be returned to the board now for the second phase. If any player bought this lava movement tile, they would place it back here as well to be available for purchase again. The lava tokens are also reset for the second half. Either place them off to the side or stack them in the middle. It's up to you. And then the second half of the game would be played exactly the same as the first. Dealing out the three palm trees onto the board as needed. But the final scoring wouldn't happen until you run out of palm tree cards and the fishing boat moves onto a space where there are no cards. Once that happens, even if there are still cards on the board, the game ends and we will score once again. Exactly the same as before. Whoever has the most points by the end of the game is declared the winner. And those are the basics of Haleakala. Now I mentioned there's an advanced mode that makes use of these lava discs. To use these discs, you'll take out all the lava cards from the two palm tree and the three palm tree decks. These lava discs can be used whenever a player places any one of their number tokens. When they place their token, they may also choose to place their lava disc, which would then take a token from the middle or off the board and place the lava disc on the topmost space in that section. This token is returned to you when the fishing boat lands on that space, you would claim your tokens as normal, or if you use the lava movement card, you can perform the action by moving over a lava token and taking the lava token if it was placed on the board. Also, when using the advanced mode rules, the players are not allowed to buy seashell cards directly before scoring, so they have to be sure to use them when they pick them up. And that's how you play Haleakala. If you have any questions, of course, leave them in the comments below or send me an email at sendingfiancegames at gmail.com. But that's all for now. Let's keep on rolling.